Step into the latest installment of our rebroadcast series, podcast number 71, titled Internalizing the Perpetual Principles of Yeshua Hamashiach, featuring Mike from COT Rebroadcast on the End Generation Project. Originally aired on May 14, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. Please see link in description. This episode goes into Bible study, highlighting eschatology amidst today's challenges. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore these peculiar circumstances in this riveting episode. To understand more, visit the Council of Time on their only official website linked in description. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction who simultaneously are seeking God's guidance. Your support drives our mission to guide individuals toward truth, sobriety, and preparedness for what is described in scripture as perilous times. Join our exclusive locals community for EGP family members and have early access to many cool things. Thank you for being a vital part of the success of the End Generation Project. Before immersing ourselves in today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 71 titled, Internalizing the Eternal Principles of Yeshua Hamashiach, we wanted to take a moment to address our recent absence and shed light on the reasons behind it. Maintaining a YouTube channel brings with it various challenges, and regrettably, the associated costs have risen significantly. Moreover, a recent relocation has further disrupted our content creation processes. Nevertheless, we are delighted to announce our return and our readiness to embark on new episodes alongside you. We are eager to unveil episode 71, where we delve into the timeless principles of Yeshua Hamashiach, and we cannot wait to share it with our audience. We appreciate your patience and understanding during this hiatus, and we're grateful for your continued support. Stay tuned for more exciting content coming your way, and thank you for being part of our community. All right. Now, let's dive into today's podcast, Internalizing the Perpetual Principles of Yeshua Hamashiach. Tune in to the rebroadcast of In Generation Projects podcast, number 71 with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. Okay, everybody. Let's go ahead and start this off early since the playlist is stuck uh, for some odd reason. Anyway, folks, hear me on this. I hope that uh, I'm going to say this about four times throughout the broadcast and please don't take chances i want you guys to make sure you back up all your data all of your data all of what you think is important back it up all data on your devices can be eliminated if you do not back it up so i hope that you guys back up your systems i'm gonna have to do the same thing personally and i hope that you guys really take that to heart I have to make that statement. Uh, I don't want to be here when, when you know, the data goes disappearing and somebody says nobody warned us. So I hope that you uh, take it to heart and back up your data, your pictures, all of it. Hope that you do that. Back up your data, all right? You guys that know about Android and Mac and Apple, right? Windows, help each other out. Back up your data. Back up your data. I know that COT has quite a bit of data to back up. Please back up your data. I will be mentioning this uh, a little later in the broadcast. But it is uh, pertinent that you guys do that. That you back up your data. There are going to be some folks that lose everything. I mean everything. So, please back it up. Back up your data. Companies like Microsoft, Android, Apple. I don't know if Apple will do it or not because their data is hosted on a cloud. But all of them are going to be putting out messages. And at your own risk, it will say, you're going to read something that says, at your own risk. If you skip backing up your data, you do so at your own risk, which means you can lose Everything on your device. Just imagine you wake up one day and your device is compromised, scrambled, and everything else. You can't log in. You can't do anything. Wiped out. Pictures, documents, everything gone. This is where we are. So I hope you guys take that to heart. 
Okay. Take it to heart. Please take it to heart. Do what you can. You guys help each other out. Please help each other out. Please do that. Now, having said that, I want to say thank you guys for being here. And uh, let's get started, shall we? We do have some wild phenomena weather-wise. Listen, I'm going to take um, 37 is our news guy, right? And so I'm going to be getting him ready for with his page to do whatever the Lord leads him to do. Uh, there are some areas we're going to do web updates on every day. We're going to start tracking things we have to. Due to the nature of the change, right, M- major changes, we want to make sure those changes are on the website, okay? We want to make sure that uh, I somewhat summarize those changes. We have really hit a time where if a person hesitates to go forward with things, it could be damaging to other folks, right? Um, you know, just yesterday I was looking at some of the casualty rating in the USA and in Europe and other places, but specifically the USA. And it's it's a um, the casualty rate of mothers and infants is starting to go up. Now, anytime that happens, and I normally track those numbers, when that starts to happen, you better believe there's a spiritual paradigm change happening also. Something is happening, right? It is uh, quite a notable data point throughout many different uh, eras that when women and children and infants specifically start to pass away, something big is on the horizon. And normally it overtakes everything fairly quickly. Okay. So please remember that. Please remember that. Somebody says, when I open COT chat, I get a message server error application. It's probably your device. I would clear your, try and go in, right? Are you going by somebody else's link or through the website? Because it must be looking for something that's not matching on the uh, site system. Also, make sure that your system is not infected or anything. Okay. Make sure. Because uh, it will only give you an error. If your device is not processing critical data, right? Or if it's keeping data, it shouldn't keep it all. Or, right, if we've done something, working on it. Now, we are working on the site, right? We are We're working on the site. But when we work on the site, sometimes your cache will not align. A cache is simply files that your computer keeps. It won't align with the files we have on the website. And your session data is not going to match. And because we, if it, if it doesn't match, um, our site will kick it out. You're going to get an error. We just don't, we don't do like other sites where they point their error to some page, right? This says, oops, there's been a problem, an issue. No, we want the raw stuff. We'll just keep it raw for now. But you must have something in your system that's not compatible. Now, that website is compatible with all devices, so you might want to check your own device out. Make sure your cache is clear. Okay. Please make sure it's clear. All right. Um, that you guys can get on there. Somebody's getting a 404. You're going, you got the wrong link. You're going to a wrong link. Are you guys utilizing? Now, I hope you're not going to the temporary chat room because you can't get there anymore. Let me see. Let me see what you guys are going to. Let's find out. da 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 da, da. Well, of course, I would be running the new version of COT, wouldn't I? You guys can't even see this. Anyway, do this. Go to the home page, right? In the center of the page, not not the um, older data, right? Not the older data. Don't go to the older data. Go to the new stuff. And in the center of that page, let me go back to the home page so I can talk through this. On the left side where it says new layout, Right? Some people are entering the chat room through there. Don't enter the chat room through there. Right? Don't do not do that one. That one's going to be taken away, period. That one's going to be gone with the wind. Go to where it says interaction. Right? And then click on that chat room where it says interaction. You'll be able to go into the chat room there. Okay? Do that. The other, I'll say it again, all those links which are under new layout, they're going to be removed. That stuff's going away. You're going to be, you'll have to use the main um, 
links, right? We're getting all that switched over. All that stuff starting to happen. So we're going to wipe out a lot because we have a lot to put in there. Okay. A lot. Somebody says, Mike, didn't you have a vision where there were no children? Uh, just so you guys know, in, in my lifetime, I've had this one occurring dream 24 times in my lifetime. And in that dream, after a specific point, there are no children. After the headlines go away, th there's a time when there are going to be no more headlines. And just to give you, just to give you an idea of that dream, um, there was a, it was flipping like pages, but there was one spot in this dream where everything was headlines. You know, in a newspaper, everything was headlines. And then all of a sudden, there were no more newspapers, no more headlines that way. But there were headlines on little these little screens, right? Now, but when I told people this, they laughed at me back in 1990s. I said, all the newspapers are going away. They start laughing. One one guy, right? Because I was concerned about it. One one uh, pastor said, oh, son, it was a, it was a uh, colleague, actually. And he said, uh, son, in spiritual things, often you have dreams that they don't equate to reality. That's what he said. And it really disturbed me, right? It did. Uh, so, but we have no more newspapers. Now, I knew that time was coming for me. This is just difficult to communicate those things because everybody wants to believe what they believe, right? But here in this time, I have to do I have to do what the Lord gave me to do. There's been a long time when I was sitting in the back. I wouldn't say anything. In this season, I have to go forward with what the Lord gives me. I do. I have to go forward with what the Lord gives me. And if people want to, everybody has to do what the Lord confirms within them. Right? If they think, think something is incorrect, don't act on it. I certainly would not act on anything incorrect. But don't act on a person's dream. Act on what the Lord gives you. Do that. Don't act on somebody else's dream. And it really doesn't matter if the whole thing comes true. But in that same dream, there's a time after Texas has fired from below and above. There are no more kids. In fact, when Texas has fires below and above, there are going to be screams from human beings. But I didn't know a human being could scream like that. I didn't know that. There were fires from above and below in Texas, specifically in Texas. That's where it began. That will spread all the way to the Appalachian Mountains, all the way to California. California is going to be totally flipped. The Grand Canyons are going to be slammed shut, it will seem. Um, from that point, a brand new type governmental system forms. After these things happen, that's what took place there. And it, again, it was like a page flipping. There are lots of little parts in between. And it's been, I documented that. I, I had that postmarked back in the 80s and 90s. I had that postmarked and mailed it to myself and three, three or four other people, right? So they have it. And they are, you know, they, um, two are not opened, right? Two are not open. They sit in two specific states. They're not opened. But the other ones, they were given to folks who they review them. I normally do not review my own dreams. I don't. I don't. Um, but I did that one because that was I was instructed to do something like that, right? And you guys know, if you've been here at COT, things come out of my mouth that sometimes are absolute, right? sometimes are immediate, sometimes not. Uh, in general, most of the days have carried something or, or, or some type connotation to what the Lord has given me. In a lot of cases, it's been exactly like the time Mayor saw exactly what that dream was set up to be. And Mayor's the one that found it on television and pointed it out to everybody. And we all sat there and watched, and I did watch in disbelief. I have to admit that. Right? Now, it doesn't make me special again. It just means I'm the one with the microphone. If you had the microphone, the Lord would give you to give to other people things. But I'll tell you something. Even if, you, even if the Lord gave you the absolute truth... It's a burden. Do you know why? Because there are going to be a great group of people who simply cannot believe something somebody says. Right? They can't believe in spiritual things. They've been raised in a world where you have to have proof. And if you don't have proof, you're going to get burned. Right? And uh, unfortunately, uh, that's the way that is. Right? But we live in different days. We do. And people are incredibly vulnerable. Vulnerable. 
there are a lot of Christians who are vulnerable, right? They may think they're strong, but here's my issue. If we drift away from foundational truths, we start going into things that are too, well, let's say too, too far in the future for us to handle right now. We're going to forget about what we're doing right now. And for example, the Lord is clear, isn't he? Something as simple as loving your enemies, we're still not able to do. We're not. We still keep pointing fingers. And I, I, you know, how do you tell a person that if they keep pointing fingers in the time when they cry out for the living God, he's just not going to answer them. If anybody, if anybody points at anybody during their calamity, God will never forget that. But how do you communicate that to a person? You can be forgiven, but you're going to reap what you sow in that area. You will not escape what's coming. And people are not, all they have to do is repent. If a person repents, repent means to turn away from and never do again, which means repent is not something you say. Repent is something that you feel, something that you adjust your life according to, is something in your heart, right? That's what repentance is. Suppose a person can't speak. How do they repent? Can a person who cannot speak, who has no vocal cords, can they repent? Yes, they can. You don't have to speak to repent. It's something as simple as this. Repentance is when, say you're involved in going to nightclubs, but inside the nightclubs, everybody's nude or something like that, right? So it's an abomination. And you one day, you get sick of going to those places and you say, you know what, I'm not doing that. That's garbage. I'm not ever doing that again. And you absolutely stand against it. Well, guess what? You just did. You have a repentant heart. And when you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I accept your sacrifice. I accept that sacrifice. And I ask for your forgiveness of that sin from going there. Then Jesus is just to forgive. And you are forgiven. Right? Now, that means you don't have a heart in your heart. Nobody can make you go back to that club. Nobody. So indeed you have repented. But if you just say, if you just feel convicted one day, for example, and you sit there and, you know, you say, well, Lord, forgive me for going to that strip club. Just asking the Lord to excuse what you did. If you still have a desire to go back to that club, you did not repent. You didn't repent because you'll go back to the club again. When we have repented, we never turn back and do that same thing again. That's repentance. Saying I'm sorry is not repentance. Turning away from something is repentance. See? See? You you guys see the difference? If I were to go back and to do something again and again and again, I never repented in the first place because it was still in my heart to do. And people are in trouble. Because you know what? There are a lot of people who don't know that. There are a lot of people who don't want to hear that. They don't want to operate by that. They don't. And they're complicit with their type. It's more convenient for them to think that they're totally excused so they can be innocent and go right back to the same vomit. Again and again and again. We had to get that right. It's a life change. I know another person said they were going to take a break from being a pastor. How do you do that? How do you do that? Still, I know more people. Right? You guys know what vetting is, right? You know what vetting is? You know when you investigate a person for problems, things of that nature, so no problems pop up where you're dealing with that person. That's vetting a person, right? How do you vet a pastor? How do you do that? Has anybody ever found that out? Do you look at a person's... What if a person was a murderer? Could that person be a pastor? What if a person was charged with a heinous crime, but they had repented? Could that person be a pastor? Hmm? What if a person was a sex-crazed lunatic and asked for forgiveness? Could that person be a pastor? Could they be a pastor? 
And it's a hard, it's a hard um, uh, scenario I'm giving. Because it's, it's, a, it's a reason why I'm saying it this way. Hmm? That person be a pastor. See, how do you vet a pastor? Or do you vet a pastor? That's when you, listen to me, you can look through a person's credentials. I'll tell you right now, I'm not, I, I can't align myself with anybody who has made no mistakes. Can't do that. Can't do it. I can't do it. Do you know that's what people are looking for? They're looking for a person who has made no mistakes. I'm looking for the opposite. I'm looking for sinners who are saved by grace. Now, you have some who are called from a line of righteousness. Right? I would call those overseers. They're in, the, they're in that level of bishops. Natural bishops is what they are because of their heritage. And if they keep that heritage, then God bless them for doing that. For those who are outside of that, those who have to do some of the grunt work, is you have coordinators and you have those who do the grunt work, right? Because everybody's not called to do, do the exact same thing. They're not. But those who have been in the mud, those are the ones who care about the people. Those are the ones who don't point fingers. If I ever pointed my finger at someone, I'd be pointing at myself. The only thing I haven't done is anything dealing with some sexual issue or something like that. Never did anything even close to that. Right? But I can almost guarantee you, you don't want to know who I used to be. You don't want to know that. If people vetted me by standards of the world, right? If they did that, they, would, they, would, they wouldn't even mention my name. They'd go walk away. This is nope, that, nope. That's what they say. Nope. No, I had very good credentials in my field, but my field itself was an abomination. Do you know that? It was, it was cruel, sometimes vicious, heartless, you name it. You know who you're talking to, to engage, or who you're engaging with requires the spirit. It requires the spirit. The Holy Spirit can let you know anything about a person. You need to know. Normally, the Holy Spirit will convey who that person actually is so that you know who you're actually talking to. The Holy Spirit is never present in a vessel who's full of rage. That's the opposite of the Holy Spirit. Even in the Bible, you can see, right? You can look at the character of all those people who hosted the Holy Spirit. They, they didn't have rage in them. Look at Saul, who turned into Paul. He had no rage in him. He used to before that because he set up, set up Stephen for false witness. You guys know that. He had people killed. He would do anything for the sake of the cause he was under for his organization. King David sent his best friend to the front line because he was craving his wife. So why did God pick them? Why did he, look at what they did. Paul was specifically picked to go to the Gentiles. What did Paul face? Paul faced a bunch of people without morals. In other words, they, were, they, they weren't raised to respect women. They were not. They weren't raised to do this. They weren't raised to do that. But the Gentiles did have something. They did have something. They had a type of loyalty that even God said his own people didn't have. That's how America was established, by the way. See, America is made out of what? People who ran away. Did you know that? Or did we forget? Why do we do that? All of us are sinners saved by grace, right? Follow me on this. All of us are sinners saved by grace. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that. We know that. We know what we have done in our lifetimes. We know the foul thoughts we had in our heads. Then we start reading the Bible. We start having changes in our lives. Our lives change in a way. All of a sudden, we get around those who would persecute somebody else, and we per jump into the to the wagon with them and start persecuting the same people they are. Why do we do that? Why don't we go from one group and instantly 
involve ourselves in another group that will still yet persecute your fellow man because we're all sinners saved by grace. So how can we point at a person who's a sinner when that's where we came from? We were the same as them. Some people call us a fallen species. So be it. But you get the point. What has happened to us? You know, the Bible does not say that at the end of time, everybody's coming to Christ. The Bible says that in these days, people are going to fall away from the faith. That's what the Bible says. They will abandon the word of God. They will think that God does, doesn't do good or evil. Or, or let's just say that he'll do nothing. That God doesn't care about these matters in the earth. People are walking around right now, Christians, saying, well, God doesn't care about me. I could die right now. Nobody cares. This is of no consequence. Yes, it is. They still can't see him. They still will not dare to find him. They won't look beyond their point of origin, which is sin itself. But my point is, we get delivered from so much, and then we go and accuse those who are a mere echo or shadow of what we used to be. Your worst enemy. A lot of, somebody, so I engaged this conversation with someone one time. I had engaged in this, and somebody said, well, I wasn't that bad. I said, oh, yeah, really? So we had a discussion. We were comparing sins. We compared death and everything else. And this person said, well, you see, he, he tried to give me an example. This person said, well, if a child loses a pet, right? A pet fish or a pet whatever. That's not the same as losing a grandparent. That's what sure it is. Sure it is. The person missed the whole thing. Loss is loss. Doesn't matter what it is. Loss is loss. If it's a dog, if it's a fish, if it's a whatever, loss is loss. Same thing. If you have experience losing the one thing, you have the experience of loss. Period. People assign a level of importance to loss based on what they lost. But it's the same thing. People will describe something a little better, but it's the same loss. And the Lord's the one that allows this, and I'm so glad he does. Do you know what would happen if nobody had a loss? Let me tell you what loss does, just so you guys understand, because we're in different days. So let me tackle the subject very simply. When you lose something and you're so broken inside, you ought to thank God. And here's why. That person that you lost, that thing that you lost, contained part of you and you were incomplete. When that thing was lost, that side of you, that was invested in that thing or that person was also lost. You're never to be that way. You're not to walk this earth broken and to be glad that you're broken. No, you're to be whole. Jesus came that we could be absolutely whole. So why would he encourage any brokenness? Now, when you have a person in your life and you're whole, I guarantee you the situation is different. Do you hear me? I, didn't, I, I wasn't in the past, but right now I'm a whole person right? I'm a whole person. So I can always compliment somebody else. No matter what problem they have, I can contribute to wholeness and it never takes away from me. See the difference? My salvation is not hinged on if somebody else stays alive or not. But see those folks who are broken when somebody is lost, they don't know that. None of us know that in the beginning. We don't know to what degree. We have lost ourselves in something else. We don't know that. And it could cost us our eternal salvation. Do you know that? A lot of people don't think of that. Your father wants you whole. Now, who allows something to pass away in the first place? Jesus has the keys of hell, death, and the grave. No one can die on this earth until Jesus says so. And I, I tell you this, if anybody has lost anybody, it is not to your hurt Jesus explained this in passages. When we lose things like that, it is not for our hurt. He has been and will continue to deliver us. Well, let's go ahead and face it. 
We're not the authors of deliverance. So many of us think we know how God is delivering everybody. No, we don't. We think we can identify every problem that we have. No, we cannot. How many of you understand that if God didn't expose you to put you in specific situations and cause specific things to happen, you would not know to repent in certain areas? How many times have we gotten ourselves into a situation and then we fell to our knees saying, Lord, forgive me, I had no idea. I had no idea that I was causing this. I had no idea the gravity of this. I had no idea. And in that moment of time, we can see the truth and we repent. But prior to that time, we did not repent. It's almost like it's impossible to think of that thing or to have that thing revealed. You guys know what I'm talking about. So the Lord is doing, he's, he's been delivering us the entire time. The entire time. Hmm? Deliverance. My goodness. Because we live in different times. You live in a time of massive manifestation. We're not just talking about spirits. No. Manifestation of the truth, meaning the revealing of truth, whether it be darkness or light. The question is, can you handle it? Because even right now, by my own personal peanut brain observations, people cannot handle the simple reality before them. They must live inside of an illusion to have hope each day. They can't even look upon the truth of a situation and walk right through it. They can't do it. They have to build an illusion around it and around themselves. How many people have decorated their homes in a specific way that when you get home, you look at your decorations and then you're okay. You take your inventory of your stuff and then you're okay. Now, before you say, nope, not me, I was there once. I know what that is. I know what it is to hear a certain song and then you're fine. I know what it is to see a familiar, you know, whatever it is on television and then you're fine. I know what it is to set up your environment to think that you're going to be free by your environment. Do you see the problem in that, though? That means if you take everything away from a person, is there a person left? Or is everything they are tied up in tangible things? Let me ask you something. Is anything that you are tied up in anything tangible? You know what your father said he's going to do, right? You know what he said he's going to do? Does anybody understand in fact, it does answer at least 75% of the question marks in your mind. But who wants to hear it? It's very simple. And it happens on a daily basis to somebody. And it will happen to all of us on occasion, from time to time. And nobody escapes it. But seldom, if ever, will you hear it acknowledged. In this world, people are always preoccupied with getting something back. Do you know that? Pre and this is not political either. Please don't affiliate this with anything you heard politically. But we are preoccupied with getting something back. We are dominated by positioning. Hear me. We are ruled by positioning ourselves. Now, people are working themselves to the bone. Why? They need to position themselves so they can relax in a few years. That's what they say, isn't it? Isn't that what they say? Isn't that why people work themselves to the bone for retirement? Aren't they trying to use strategy in life so they can sit back and do nothing? Isn't that true? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be, isn't that a common theme for all of us, every single last one of us? To do what we have to do so we can sit back and not do anything. Come on, folks, stay with me. Nobody try to act like you're so holy you didn't do that. That means you never thought about retirement. That means you never thought about a better home. That means you never thought about a better position. Hmm? Somebody says, that's a myth. That's good. That means you did it too. See, when you say it's a myth, that means it, it feels sometimes unattainable. That's just an admittance of the truth because we've all been doing that, right? Anybody see any problem with that? Hmm? 
Anybody? Anybody see any issue with that? Hear me on this. If you build your paradise here on this earth, which is what a lot of people think the Bible says, you can have paradise here on earth. I'll tell you right now, I don't have paradise here on earth. But I have a joy. I'm not trading for anything. You could say, you could say, I'm quickly returning back to the innocence of a child. You could say that. You could say that. But I'm not pursuing anything for me. See, I used to pursue all things to secure a future for me and those connected to me. I did. Isn't that a responsible thing to do? Of course it is. Of course it is. But here's the problem. When you start living today for for 20 years from now, you just misaligned yourself with the principles of the Most High. There's no faith in that, is it? No faith, is it? When you are working, I've seen people work today, cuss everybody out that you ever saw today so they can have their future, never get their future and just simply die. And when they're gone, nobody remembers them and all their work was in vain. I've seen other people, right? I've seen other people concede that maybe they won't reach that point. They treat everybody like gold. And then all of a sudden those people are elevated without, they don't even know how they get in the good position they're in. It's a law on sowing and reaping. See, what we forget is this. You reap what you sow. Sometimes we forget we sow every single day. If you sow mercy in a time when you need it most, you're going to reap mercy. If you sow darkness in the time when you don't need that darkness to show up, it's going to show up in force at the wrong time and multiply your troubles. I've been there too. Anybody ever been there? You ever have a person show up at the wrong time and say the wrong thing? I mean the absolute wrong time, and they say the absolute wrong thing in the absolute wrong subject. You ever see that? But then you look back in your life and you say, wait a minute, I I sowed that seed I know I did somewhere. And sure enough, you go back in your life and you find out that seed you sowed. You find out you sowed quite a few seeds like that. Just because you forget about them does not mean they're gone. They'll come back at a time when you do not expect them. They will multiply your troubles. But when that same situation is on somebody else, hear me on this. When somebody else is going through something, if one of you went through something, let's say one of you chewed me out every single day, right? You chewed me out every day. I want you guys to give me an answer so I can give you the biblical answer. You chew me out every single day, but then all of a sudden, as just what the Bible states starts happening in your life, do I have a right to point to you and say, see, see what you get? Can I talk, should I talk to anybody and say, I want you to look at so-and-so, how they just went straight down to the ground because of what they did. Should I ever do anything like that? Yes or no? If indeed a person, if you see a person in the world, let's just say for the sake of this conversation, that you think they're falling under God's judgment, do you have a place to say anything about them? Yes or no? Do you have a place? Do you have room? Do you have the right to point your finger at them in any way? Yes or no? By the word of God, do you? Do you? You guys are absolutely different. Let me tell you why. If you ask this question to most people, right? At least 80% will say, yes, you have a right to say something. It has a new chat room for some new people. At least 90%. You know what they said? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because God said we would see the calamity of the unrighteous. They began to justify They're gloating over somebody else's calamity. You know what the Lord God said? You ought to hold your tongue in somebody else's calamity. Lest the Lord put that same calamity on you. Never forget your royalty. Never forget who you really are. You may be here on earth and people may call you a nobody. That's not who you are. If you were a nobody, you would not be here on this earth. Do you know that? You wouldn't be here on this earth. You wouldn't have life. 
So let me tell you what our father does. First of all, he gets involved when anybody mocks anybody else's calamities. This you will see with your own eyes. I'll tell you this now. If anybody you hear, and I pray the Lord open your ears so that you can hear it clearly. If anybody you hear mocks somebody else's calamity, a worse calamity will befall the person who mocked them. That will frighten you to see that come to pass. And you will see it come to pass. When a person is a low life, do you have a right to point a finger at that person? How many, how many times I've heard it before. I'm sure that you guys heard it before that a person said, well, you know, I saw this brother was doing something wrong. This sister was doing something wrong. So I had to go tell them. I know they didn't want to hear it, but I had to go tell them and they don't want to hear anything from me, but I had to go tell them. Anybody ever hear that? Anybody ever do that? Let me answer that for you. Of course we did. And it didn't work out so well, did it? Didn't work out so well. Did it? You ever go to a friend? You ever tell another friend, hey, I had to go to my friend. My friend was over there sinning, and, and the Lord told me that the blood's going to be on my hands if I don't intercede and tell that person something. Right? And that will do, that's what the word says. If you do not warn the people, right? That, that's in the Bible. It is, isn't it? Isn't it? So I heard a person, a person came to me one time, they said, uh, Mike, I had to go to the person and tell them because I saw them doing this and I had to go tell them. I said, well, how'd you tell them? He said, well, I had to tell them forcefully so they would really get it. And I said, well, what happened? Well, that person punched me. Why would the Lord allow that? I just kind of put my head down like, oh boy, really? Really? Are we ever going to learn? So here it is. If you don't love someone, you have no business going to them in the first place. Don't ever go to someone you do not love because you're not going to tell. If you don't love someone and you go to them, you're not going to give them your father's word. Your father's word only goes out in love. If you know that, you're in the era of grace and mercy. How can God's word go out in any other characteristic than love itself? The whole motivation behind God's word is love right now. It's not punishment. It's love. You can't go to someone you don't love. You would know if somebody came to you in a spirit other than love. And what dominates? What spirit rises in the absence of love? Hmm? Offense? Anger? Rage? Resentment? You can't go to someone. Unless you truly love them. Unless, unless you have an established relationship with a person. How can you tell them anything? Hmm? Why would you want to tell somebody something and you don't love them? You have no business going to that person. See, that's the problem. When you go to, suppose someone is doing something. And the Lord said, don't do it or you'll surely die. The Lord said, Michael, I want you to go and tell that person something. Every single time the Lord has done that, it's been to someone I deeply cared about. Do you know that? He never sent me to anybody I didn't care about to give any word to them. That's a fact. That's a fact. You know, Jeremiah was sent to his own people. He loved his people. Why do you think he suffered so much? Now you know why these men did not retaliate. Because they loved the people they went to. They loved their countrymen. Do you know that? They loved them. So much so they would suffer for them. They loved them. The Lord cultivates. You can see it with the apostles. He prepares them to go to people. God's not going to send you to a person where they don't remember what you said and what you said fails to transition. No. God's not going to send you somewhere for no reason. We don't serve a God like that. We don't. You know, in this world, that, that, that characteristic, that principle is lost. People go to people for the type of attitude to rule over them, to govern them, to say, hey, listen to me, because I'm older than you. They do it. 
They do it, don't they? And it's ineffective. God never sent me to a person that rejected what I had to say when he ever sent me one-on-one. He never sent me to a person that rejected. He always sent me to those who were receptive to what I had to say. You know what the apostles he sent out two by two? He sent them everywhere. Why? Because they were laying the foundation. What did he tell them to do when people would not receive what they said? What did he tell them to do? He said, shake the dust off your feet. Do you guys know what that means? You're looking at people who walked in the deserts a lot. Do you know what that phrase means? Shake the dust off your feet. Let me tell you what that means. When you go somewhere to somebody's house, right? And say, you know, you're in a relationship with them. You you like them. They're your family members. But they reject any word coming from you dealing with the most high. And it's a very sincere and true word that God gave you to give them. Not something you made up. Not something you deem they needed. But something God sent you with. And they rejected that word. God said, shake the dust off your feet. You leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. And what that means is you don't carry the residue of that place anywhere else. You leave all the dirt on your feet, the evidence of the travel and everything else. You leave it there at that location. You do not take it to your next location. Let me translate that to modern day life. Don't take your past rejections to a brand new place. You don't do that. You shake the dust off your feet. You leave it to that place. If they reject you over there, then leave it over there. Don't ever bring it over here. That means don't bring yesterday's rejections into today. That means don't bring your rejections of somebody else's household to this household. That's what that means. Shake the dust off your feet. Do you know how many people carry around their dusty? With the wrong dust. They got a story from everybody who ever rejected them. Until that becomes their main story. That's when they become Charlie Brown. Because they always have a bad story. About everything that went wrong. And nothing that went right. Why? Because they never knew that. They never knew that God told them to do that. You know, he also, in the Old Testament... The living God told us to do that day by day. Do you know that? You're not to carry yesterday's grief with you. Remember when Jesus said, take no thought of tomorrow. Remember he said that? Remember he said the flowers and the birds and all these things, they don't clothe themselves. They don't worry about water. God provides as they need. He said, take no thought of tomorrow for today holds enough trouble by itself. Well, if you take no thought of tomorrow, right? And you're, you center yourself in this moment in today, right? That means you're going to deal with everything you have today for today. Remember Martha? Oh, what are we going to do about this? Oh, we might need this and we might need that. We got to do this. And he said, Martha, you're going crazy. You're thinking about things outside of your power. God did not put you here to make sure all those preparations were made. That's not what you're here for. See, Martha was worried about everything she saw. God said, "Huh." Uh-uh. The Lord said, no, what are you doing? What are you doing? You, all you're going to do is tire yourself out. Stop worrying about everything you see that's going wrong, that you perceive that's going wrong, and handle what God is giving you power to handle, and leave the rest be. Brings out a life principle that you can actually use. You ready? If you don't have power to change it right there in that moment, it's not yours to concern yourself with. Then you cast your cares upon the Lord. Those who carry around those who are laden, right, with all these heavy burdens, that means you're thinking about things you have no power to change. You are not to carry them. Isn't that why the Lord said, cast your cares upon him? Well, if you cast your cares upon him, why do you still think about them? When you cast your cares upon the Lord, just simply say, Lord, you got this. I can't do it. You've empowered me for my task of this moment. This is what I have. This is what I don't have. Let me go forward with what I have. And you live your life in righteousness, being whole with your head lifted up and simply say, thank you, Lord. See the situation for what it is. Every single day of my life, there are situations I cannot change. 
I can't do anything about. Some of those situations are right in front of my face and I can't do anything about it. I've not been empowered to do anything about it. I can pray, yes. But I'll tell you something, I'm not like most folks. If I pray, I'm not going to sob about it. Why would a person pray and still sob about something as though the Lord is one inch high, can't do anything, weak, 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 weak. No, that's not who our father is. If I pray to the most high, that's my confidence. If I do pray to the most high and can't do anything, you better believe I do not carry any negative connotation with me ever. Do you know why? Because I have all faith in the Lord my God. What about you? Do you have faith in your father? Yes or no? Ask yourselves that. When you pray to the Lord about something, you just told him about something that you're concerned about. You understand that he hears your prayer. But do you have faith in him to handle it? Hmm? Because there's only one way I can not have faith in the Lord to handle something. You ready? It's when I want something done a specific way. It's when I do not trust the outcome of anybody else but me. Well, I'm not like that. I'll do everything I can. But when I can't do anything, I simply pray and I leave that with the most high. It's not mine anymore. I'm on to the next thing. How many of you know a tactic of Satan that works? He will steal your joy. Now, let me first tell you this. that In a moment of weakness, Satan can use anybody he can get to. That means you too. If I had a moment of weakness, he could use me too. Let's make that clear. Okay? Now, let me establish that first now. I want you guys to, 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 to take note of something. Take note of something. Let's see. Should I say this before or after? This could be too big. Could take up too much time. Robin said break time, right? I can't just ignore Robin. He's been saying that for years. How can I just, you know, just ignore that? But, but hear me. Before I get into some more principles, hear me on this. You've had the training. All of you have had the training. You've been through situations that allow you to understand these principles perfectly. Consideration time is now. Application time is now. It's when you take what you have learned and you employ it. It's called wisdom. When I come back from this break, I'm going to tell you a tactic of Satan you need to know about. Because I'll tell you right now, it works every single day. It works every day. I'll be back in a moment right here at the Council of Time. And forgive me if the same song is playing over and over again, right? Somehow I lost control over the playlist. I'll be right back in just a few moments. Okay, I can't torture you guys with the same song over and over again. I can't do that. Anyway, back to what we were talking about. All right, first of all, first of all, I want you guys to know that in a moment of weakness, Satan can utilize anybody. If you have paper, write that down. Please write that down. You might need to know it. Second, what I'm about to tell you is something you guys, you already know it, but it's very difficult to apply because there are forces fighting it, which means even by telling you this, it's going to cause compromised individuals to get very upset. Now, they won't really understand why they're upset because it is 100% spiritual. That's why I'm not worried about those people hearing this because it's 100% spiritual. Okay? It's 100% spiritual. I'm not concerned about them hearing it, though they will get agitated. They will do everything in their power to steer you away from it. Why? Because this issue causes a barrier of the true identification of love. And how many people out there have an issue with love itself? You can be honest. You hear it, C-O-T. You can be honest. I already know that lots of people have an issue with the fullness of love. In other words, you can't commit fully to love's way yet. I already know you can't. Can't do it because of the barrier. And the barrier is what Satan keeps, the big 
the big guy, the big dark guy, right? The worm that people will look narrowly upon. He keeps it. He must keep it. Because if he ever loses this barrier, he's gone. So I'm telling you, they'll fight tooth and nail to make sure that that word love is offensive to most, especially Christians. It'll make you not trust it. It'll make you not want to hear it. In fact, because it's at the root of a problem, this sometimes turns into a very sensitive area. But it's a tactic darkness uses every day, and it is most effective. And when people get into this area of life, it's Satan's avenue into your life. You may not know he's there, right? Satan will often appear in the form of helplessness. He does. When you're converting, in the process of converting, or you have converted and want to go further, and you're very sincere about going further. Especially when you have great compassion locked up inside you. You can't let that compassion out because you know people are going to take advantage of it. Especially when love was betrayed in your life at a young age. Especially if you're in a situation now where betrayal is the order of the day. People call that a dark place. Let's open it all up, shall we? So keep in mind, anybody at a moment of weakness can be utilized. I'm going to name a scenario. All of you can relate to. All of you can. Now, if you found yourself in this predicament, don't worry about it. It happens to all of us. Until it's caught, it continues. Once it's caught, Satan will begin to fight. To intrude back in your life again. Because he does not want you to breach the barrier. Because if you breach a specific barrier, you'll see love for what it is and trust it and actually embrace it. And thus you'll have completeness. See, people are walking around right now. They're Christians. They believe in Christ. But there's a brokenness inside and they know it. We're not talking about the void. We're not talking about that void. We'll talk about that next, possibly. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the brokenness. The issue, the irritation and aggravation that comes to you from time to time when dealing with that subject of love. It's when you have a good heart. And at the same moment, finally, when your heart is a, is is in a good place, here comes someone to mess it up. Here comes something to mess it up. No, this is a tactic. All of you know this scenario. There's a there are people, a person could be people. Normally, it's a person in your life that will often come to you. And the more you seek the Lord, the more they come. When they come to you, they come to you needing some sort of help. That's what it seems like. They need your help. They always make it seem like they could use your direction. They always make it seem like they need help specifically from you. And they empower the individual they go to to believe that they can indeed help them. So guess what you end up doing? You end up having this person in your life quite a bit. But only for one reason. See, they call you with what's wrong with them. And you hear them. Now, at first, you're willing to help. But you start to notice, as soon as you start to speak, they have a rebuttal for everything that you have to say. And the next day, or the next time, they come with the same problem. And the next time, they come with the same problem. And they continue to have these problems. And then one day... You finally say, well, I can't deal with this person like this, you know. This person just ties up my time, so you start avoiding that person because that person's hurt. Because somehow they all know when you're avoiding them, and they'll often say things to you like, you shouldn't be that way. Let me tell you, first of all, that's supernatural. For them to know what you're doing without them being in proximity to you is impossible. That's supernatural. So they will throw that guilt trip, trip on you in a minute. And make you feel guilty to listen to them some more. And now you're stuck. And every time this person comes around, for some reason you have adjusted your life for this person. So let me tell you what's happening here. When you're a Christian and you seek to convert, Satan is losing his grip on you and your life. He has to get back at you some way. 
just to tie you up. He has to make sure you never see love for what it is. Because in the Bible, it's written that God is love. If you see love for what it is, you will absolutely a thousand percent know who your father is. And at that point, he has lost all power over your life. When you know who your father is absolutely in love, he has lost all power in your life. See, that's a day when you wake up differently. And every spirit around you knows it. Creation knows it. Everything knows it. And everything in your life is altered. He can't afford for that to happen. So he assigns a person in their weakness to you. And this person will come to you saying, oh, you know, they want your advice. They can go to anybody else. They want your advice. So for some people, it's a person who talks about their aches and pains all the time. They don't, they may not even know they're doing it. So never blame them. For others, they're talking about their something going wrong in their life. And it's the same thing every single time. And no matter what you say, they have a rebuttal. You'll give them a fix. You might even feel proud of yourself saying, hey, I gave that person a fix. The very next day, they act like you never said a thing. Then you begin to wonder, how in the world do I get free of this person? But unknowingly, you've adjusted your life for them. Because they're spiritually assigned to you. Spiritually. Some of you have had a thought, a dream of people needing help from you, but it comes with a warning. See, it's quite a few people who are converse Christians who have had a dream, some sort of vision of a person needing help from them. And they're trying to get into your life. That's what that dream meant. It's an agent trying to get into your life. And they always come in innocently. Hear me on this. When these people have these problems like that, it could have been that that these people are being used at their moment of weakness when they have a problem like this. It certainly starts to drain you. You don't know how to get out of it. You've already tried. Supernaturally, they know how to say the right words to get you to hear them over and over and over again. Many of you have tried to tell them, hey, look, I can't, you know, so-and-so. But then they have you feeling so guilty. You almost feel obligated. That's how you know it's supernatural. So, time for you to see it. Anybody who wants to break that, believe it or not, that's part of your fight. And you're going to win. It's a short fight. It is. See, they're coming to you and they're exploiting you. When you come to the Lord... You do so, and you have a heart for other people naturally. But you also have wounds, scars. And so you want your love to be genuine, not phony. You've already been backstabbed. You've already been betrayed. You've already been immersed in things. You've already done things you're not proud of. Right? So you know all the phoniness there is. And you want this person to have something genuine. You're trying to find out how to reach them. They're not interested in you finding out how to reach them. They're using you as a trash can. They're filling you up and taking away your time. Spiritually, they're doing this on purpose. The person doesn't know about it, but the spirit does. So how do you stop that? You have to see it for what it is. Before this break, I said, the Lord said, cast your cares upon me. There are often times you can't do anything for a person. You can't. You cannot, if you ever leave that to linger, you've already messed up. You hear me? Listen, if you cannot help a person and you don't communicate that you cannot help a person and you let that linger, darkness will take advantage of your untruthfulness. Do you hear me? Darkness will always work within the realm of darkness and it will find darkness wherever it is. We'll see every time. Every time we portray that we can handle something, but we cannot. That is an area, a misleading area within us. Do you see that? Do you guys see that? That's us not wanting to admit that we don't have anything to help this person out with. And if we don't tell it, guess what we're doing? Is that misleading? Yes, it is. So darkness will take full advantage of it. Now, it may seem slight, but I'm giving you the principle here. 
That is the principle. So what do you do in that case? When a person comes up to you and you have no power to help them in any specific area, then you let them know, I can't do anything for you in that area. Is there anything else I can do? I can't help you in that area. Never be afraid to tell a person what you can't handle either. I can't handle that. That's what you tell them. Leave no area to question. You let them know. Be blunt. Now, had you done that in the beginning, it would have been different. But the truth is, we did not. We, collectively, we did not. We sat there, we listened as though we could do something about it. Why? Because, let's go ahead and face it, Satan knows all elements of pride. He knows what makes a person proud of themselves. Nothing can make a Christian prouder than to be able to help somebody else. There it is. And so because of that area, it turns into pride. Not actually being proud, but the thought of being proud and the activities, any misleading activity that leads to that is already bound in darkness. And so what we do is we complement that by saying, yes, I can do something for this person, do or die. We're going to find a way. But the truth is, the Lord is the one that can fix it, not us. We, we would just feel proud if we could help a person. So in effect, the enemy looks at our wounds and he knows how to pull our heartstrings. And whatever problem they have is designed to keep you engaged. And so long as you do not say, hey, I can't help you in this area. But I can, you know, pray to the Lord. He, he can help you in this area. Right? So long as you don't say that, they're going to dump it on you. You have just assumed the responsibilities of the Messiah. That doesn't sound right, does it? Of course it doesn't. We're not the ones to fix anything. He'll keep us in that area for a long time. And it will drain the living life out of you. It will. And that person will end up having leverage over you, do you hear me? Because it will turn into something else after a time. So how do you address that? You have to see for what it is. The Lord said, now I'm paraphrasing, cast your cares upon him. In those areas you can't handle, you have no power to do anything about, cast it upon him. So when that person comes to you with an insuperable problem or a simple problem, right? but you can't do anything about it at that moment in time, you ask that person straight to their face, like I did somebody one time, because before I tell you the answer, I went through this. There was a person that kept popping up. Both of us are battle dogs, we call ourselves, right? But unlike that person, this person carries some wounds and scars, so I thought. So they would come to me. This is like every Thursday or Friday or something like that. I have these long stories of the whole thing, right? And this person would come to me, you know, with a drink or something like that. And every time I saw that person, I thought, oh, my goodness gracious. But being the compassionate person I was, bound by love itself, I give it time. I couldn't just walk away. That seemed to be, you know, hateful. That's not what the Lord was. And so my heartstrings, this person pulled at me. So I would sit down and hear this person. After about six months, I said, Lord, are you going to do something about this? Wait a minute. Because the Lord started showing me things. And I had a dream about this guy coming to me. He had the same question every few seconds in the dream. And I was like, what kind of crazy dr dream is this? This is crazy. And I was trying to talk to the person. And the person didn't want to hear me. And they would come back with the same question like it was in a loop. I said, oh, no, until I finally shut the door. And then the person was inside with me with the same question. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I can't have this. Lord, how do I fix this? Because I perceived it was something spiritual going on with this. Right? The Lord gave me the answer. This guy kept coming to me, asking me, or, or putting all this stuff on me, and I was thinking in my head, Lord, what do I tell him? What do I tell him? You know, use me, Lord. Use me to help this person. But I was overlooking one thing. This person did not never ask me for help. Not once. Do you know that? 
the person was telling me all their troubles, but they never asked me for help. And I, as soon as I saw that, I said, how did I miss that? And then the Lord showed me I could not help that person. I wasn't in the place to do it. And the Lord gave me the answer. He didn't tell me. It just popped in there. You know what it was? And I did it too. This person came the next time I said, listen, listen, listen. I said, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And the person stopped talking, period. He said, huh? I said, what you don't, what do you want Jesus to do for you? I said, man, you're broken. You're broken. And everything has failed or you would not be here. So what do you want Jesus to do for you? Because I can't do anything for you. We're making no progress here. What do you want Jesus to do for you? This person got their stuff, got up and walked out. It's that simple. They couldn't even answer the question. Do you not know the person does not remember that conversation? Go figure. Go figure. And there was the answer. Instead of you, instead of you trying to help someone in an area God has not assigned you to, ask that person boldly. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want from Jesus? Let me tell you something. Those spirits will try to drain everything out of you. They don't want to talk to their jailer. They do not. If anything foul, listen to me. If anything foul is behind that, and that's your comment you make to them, they want nothing else to do with you. I notice something too. When people like that come toward you, they will steer the conversation around Jesus. Have you noticed? They'll talk about Christianity. They'll talk about the Bible, but they steer it around the obvious. They don't want to talk about what Jesus can do for them. Because you've asked, you know, no doubt you've been in the conversation. You said, well, did you pray? Yeah, I tried prayer. Yeah, I tried this. Yeah, I did this and tried that, tried that. So that's when you stop trying to help them do anything. And you say, what do you want Jesus to do for you? You get to the, get to the nitty gritty of it, right? To the root of it. And you let them know, I cannot help you in this. What do you want the Messiah? What do you want Jesus to do for you? It starts changing things. It changes things. That'll make a person. Because in the next time, when you meet this person, right, you have nothing for them. Jesus does. You're not their solution. The Lord is. And then we get back to what Jesus commissioned us to do. Not to go out and fix everybody but to point everybody towards him, to let them know that he is the great physician, to let them know that he can heal them, to let them know that he can break the chains. That's the message, isn't it? Not here to break people's chains, to give them a quick fix. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to let people know that Christ died for them, and he will do it. And they need to address him. They need to spend their time asking him to fix them. And I can join them in prayer. I can support them. I can agree with them. But I cannot fix them. I'm not the answer. The Lord is. Now, isn't it funny when you engage with people? If you do not bring that up, if you do not say that honestly, a conversation and, and these circle conversations can last for years. Nobody get offended. Because, again, Satan can use anybody at any time. In a moment of weakness, anybody's prone to do anything. Right? Never blame the person. Nine times out of ten, the person has no idea what they're doing. These are coordinated tactics from a dark realm. And it's not the person's fault. It's in our own weaknesses that he utilizes us. And believe it or not, when these people get to you, you get to other people. They can irritate you so much, you'll end up passing that irritation on to somebody else. It's like poisoning, right? The root of a plant. You poison the root, then guess what? All that's going up through the whole plant. Eventually, everybody gets a little bit of that poison. It's like having a bad day. If you have a bad day and somebody approaches you, you're going to say, I don't have time to talk. I, look, I can't talk about this. People go to funerals, right? After the funeral, they can't talk to anybody. 
why? Because I have a specific mindset. It's like the word of God. You, do, do you guys know, I would never talk to you guys if I were emotionally compromised. I have no right touching the word of God. If I have an issue with someone, I have no right touching the word of God. If I'm compromised emotionally in any way, I have no business talking about the word of God. Do you know why? It's going to be tainted. It's going to be tainted. If I'm in a high state of fear, I have no business handling the word of God because everything I, ta I talk about is going to have that fear element in it. I've seen people mad at other people, and when they talk with the word of God in their mouth, it is an angry thing that comes out. I've seen that. You get a person that's been, I don't know, attacked by a person or talked about by people or something like Then they handle the word of God. They're going to point to everything in the word of God, how to watch out for those folks. We do that as human beings. That's why I don't touch the word if I'm ever compromised like that. I have no business speaking to you guys about the word of God. I better get that thing straight. Right? That's why the Lord said, if you have an alt with your brother, leave your gift at the altar, go settle that thing, and then come back. Don't you step foot on the altar, messed up and compromised, because everything you speak is going to be tainted with what you're messed up or compromised with. Believe it or not, this can happen on a daily basis outside of the knowledge of people, the normal knowledge of people, because they don't know what to look for. Listen, we're here to combat. Jesus came to do what? To destroy the works of the devil. These are up to just a portion of his works. We're not here to attack, but to free. Livingstone said, I came with the same question. All of us have had that to somebody at some degree, haven't we? All of us. All of us have gone to someone with some sort of problem. And I'm telling you this because all of us at a moment of weakness have been utilized by forces that were unholy. Holiness does not encourage a person to sin, and all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have. So, no, we can't point at each other and say, well, you were the one, and you were the one. No, all of us were the one at some point in time. The key to this conversation is to identify it and say, oh, no, nope, not a day more. Not a day more. Because when they compromise you, you're, you compromise, you're compromised. And it will spread. It will. It'll always spread. When you put a halt to it, my goodness. Listen, because it is spiritual. Listen to me. Nobody go anywhere. Listen to me. When you put a halt to it, there's going to be kicking and screaming. Because I'm telling you right now, it's spiritual. I told you before I ever told you anything. Satan is not going to like it. He does not like to lose real estate. He will cause a mess. Do you hear me? Expect it so that you're not overtaken by his tactics. Huh? I have an understanding that when Satan loses territory, you remember when Jesus cast out those demons, right? And he said, listen, he was telling his disciples. He said, when a demon is cast out, it goes out and finds nothing but dry places. So it comes back to the place it was cast out of, back to its territory. And if he sees that the house is swept clean, nothing in it, it's going to go out and find seven worse than it is. And then it's going to come back and the person's end condition is going to be worse than the first condition. So demons don't like to lose real estate. You are that real estate. You are. So when they have used you and they are ejected, they're going to fight to come back. That's what you expect. Do you hear me? So that means once you stand on a principle, never abandon that principle. That's not some rule. That's so that you're not overtaken and compromised any further. See, when God gives us some sort of declarative statement like that. And he says, listen, children, don't do this. He's not standing up there with a stick in his hand, like somebody from earth saying, don't you do this and don't do that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, hey, don't do this or you will lose your soul. Don't do this. Or you're going to have a bad headache for about three years. Don't do this or your life is going to implode for about two years. That's what he's saying. He's telling us consequences are coming. That darkness, you remember when Jesus said, you guys, you disciples, you pray with me, right? Remember they fell asleep? What did Jesus tell them? 
He said, you can't pray with me one hour. He said, don't you know that Satan desires you? You remember he said that. He said, Satan desires you. You guys remember? That's what Jesus told them. In other words, hey, look, 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 look. Once you're on this path, don't sit there and go to sleep. You know, don't pass out. Don't back out. Don't do that. Because Satan is right behind you, waiting for his moment to get in. He's, try, he's been trying to get you from day one. He's going to double his efforts. The more territory he loses with you, the more he's going to assign to you. So in other words, listen, never look back. That's what that is. When, you, when you're not looking back and you're forever going forward, you'll never go back into that weak step again. Every step you leave, right? In order to leave one step, you have to be strong enough to make another. So if you go backwards, that's a weakened state. If you start going into a weakened state, they are right behind you waiting to devour you. Do you hear me? Right now, those of you who gave your life to Christ, all those demonic entities that can no longer interfere with you, are right behind you. They are waiting for you to slip up, give up, give in, whatever the case is, so they can get what they lost. They desire to have you back fully, and that means for you to be in absolute darkness. They want you destroyed. But God empowered you to walk right out of their stuff. Do you hear me? In the Bible, when God tells you something, He's giving you ways to stay on that path of righteousness and to defeat darkness every step of the way. He's not ordering anybody to do anything. He's telling you what the situation is. It'd be like somebody coming down here who has spiritual eyes and they, they tell you, hey, hey, listen, there are 50 million demons behind you. They were all with you in the beginning. But those were all ejected. So keep stay on that path of righteousness because they await for you to go backward. And if you go backward, they're not going to be your friends. They're going to fully devour you. That's why Jesus said, when you cast out a demon and it's ejected from a person, that, per that, that demon's going to go out and find nowhere else like you. Nowhere else like where he was kicked out from. And it's going to come back. And if it sees a house swept clean, that means empty, not filled with any anything. Hmm? It's going to go out and find seven worse than it is. And that word means stronger. And then it says all those seven plus itself. They're going to enter into the person and the person's end condition will be worse than the first condition. Now, Jesus gave an example to us about a person that was totally possessed by demons. Remember when he kept healing, he healed a person. And what did he say? Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. He was giving us a principle. He was telling us what the spiritual realm was like, a part that we cannot see. Hmm? He kept saying it too, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Why? Because when Jesus healed them, he also forgave them. And if they enter back into that sinful thing again, those demons are waiting to devour them. He was telling us the truth. That's why I'm so grateful for the word of God. And when you start living the word of God, you start seeing all these things. It's mind-blowing. But then uh, it, there's a sad part to it, too. There's so many who cannot see it. There's so many who cannot believe it. And whenever you're working with people, you have to go by the word of God. They can't believe the absolutes. Precept by precept. Line upon line. Here a little. There a little. Hmm. See that? Somebody has a good question. They said, well, what was that, uh, that passage? Where it says perfect love casts out all fear. Very easy to qualify to. Let me ask you guys something, right? We're going to go to John 4.18. Let's go to John 4.18. And I'll show you this. So it's not a mystery. It won't be a mystery. 
John 14 says, let's, uh, let's correct that, shall we? First John 14, not the gospel of John. First John, because I know somebody's going to go to the gospel of John. 14 says, there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. But what is the subject of this whole thing? Hmm? Here it is. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. That's a way that's naturally in all of you. So 1 John 4, 7 is telling you, guess what? You know what it's telling you? It's telling you that you're of God. You know why? Because when you were little, you had natural love within you. It may have been perverted. It may have been changed because of abuse and other things, but you had love within you. So that means what? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God. So what are you born of? God. Or you would not have love, you would have hate. And I've seen one person in my life that did not have love when they were small. I, I know of one person in my life that did not have love when they were small. They didn't. But it says, everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Let's continue. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If you cannot love, you do not know who your father is. And that is true. You may have a description, but you don't know who he is. You cannot connect with him if you don't know who he is. Let me continue. And this was manifest the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that he might live through him. That we might live through him. That we might live through him. Through who? Through Christ. That we might live through Christ, not on our own. Through Christ, not making up something else, but through Christ. Let's continue. So God knows what he's, what he's given a man here to talk about when he's talking about love itself, right? Follow me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he, listen, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also love one another. That's very easy to understand. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. There's your key scripture. First John 4.12 is a key scripture. Here it is again. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now it said perfect love cast out all fear. You hear me? Listen. The, the key is right here in First John 4, 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, there it is. If we love one another, there it is. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. Do you see that? That means if you have somebody you do not love, God's love is not perfected in you. Why? Because you're still seeing flesh. You're still seeing by the eye over the truth. And what is the truth? That there are lots of folks out there compromised by darkness. You still blame the flesh because it's all you can see. And the spiritual is invisible, so you cannot love that person because you're assigning blame to them. You're saying it's their fault. When you say something is a person's fault, that's an outright lie. Because we know that God said it is not in a man to take a step of himself. You do is influenced. Sorry, it is. Right? So, But if we love one another, then we'll also labor for one another. Not accuse, but labor. And in that, once we love one another, then God's love is perfected in us. And that perfected love casts out all fear. If you hate your enemy, God's love is not perfected in you, and you're going to have fear in your life. You know what fear is unregulated? Hatred, violence, and anger. It's a manifestation of it. See, I found out something a long time ago, but I'm not fearful of something. I'll never get angry at it because I can see the truth of it. A person comes at me with a knife, right? Now, if you do, if you just see the person with a knife and you think that person orchestrated the whole thing, you might say, you know, you might be scared. 
but you're also going to be angry, especially if you knew that person, right? Angry at the person saying it's all their fault, you know, they did. But if you see the truth, that that person is compromised, that something has influenced that person and jumbled up their mind enough that they would ever take a knife to run and stab you, you can love the person and stand against every spirit that influenced that person. You can actually, in your heart, set that person free, love them, and desire salvation upon them and God's intervention upon them, but be against every spirit that influenced them. When you do that, there's no fear left. Why? Because you're operating in the realm of truth. So long as we live by the eye, we're not living by truth. What we see by the eye is not the truth. It is the result of another action. That's why it's not the truth. The end result of something, right, is not the origin of it. So when we treat it like it is the origin of it, then we within ourselves are acting upon a lie. So how can God intervene in any lie like that? If one of you truly, honestly thought I was an evil person, I can hold nothing against you. I couldn't. Couldn't do that. There are people who've cursed me out. I never held anything again. There are people that said awful things about me. That's how I know they don't know me. Right? Why would I be angry at them? But now, if I believe the origin of that evil is that person, I might be angry at them, right? Because I'm believing what I'm seeing. And because I'm believing what I'm seeing, I'm not going to like them. Love is severed from me to them. But that would always cause fear to rise within me. Anytime we operate in any portion of darkness, fear is always the cousin or the relative of darkness that will always surface. Always. Once you know the truth, there is no fear left. There's no fear in truth. There's no fear in truth. Fear is a lie within itself, a construct. Part of our imagination run amok. Most things you ever feared in life never came true. Never happened. You were scared to death of this and scared to death of that. Only at the end did you find out, well, it really had didn't have the power I thought it had. So most of our lives have been tied up in fear for no reason. Other than we believed what we were seeing by the eye. Can, can you all see that? What you see by the eye is not the truth. It isn't. It isn't. See, it's just like me. A lot of people say, well, how can you not? How can you not stand up against this person or that person? Because I can see Satan behind the works of that person. Why would I stand up against the person when I know that the origin of the works, how it's working, where it's working, where it came from, and everything else? I'm not against the person. I'm against the forces that influenced that person, that convinced that person. I am not against the person. That makes a difference. See, a Christian, when the Lord said, love your enemies, that's very easy to do. All you have to do is see the truth. I don't blame people for doing things. Not when I know darkness is behind it. And sure enough, you can match every single deed, every output with some sort of input that's common in the Bible of darkness. In other words, all these deeds of evil are replicated over and over again. And you can go and find them in the Bible. And the origin of those deeds in the Bible are Satan himself. And you can see it over and over again. I don't agree with Satan. See, Satan agrees he wants you condemned. He wants you to enter into sin and for the Father to condemn you. I don't agree with Satan. I agree with my Father. That while men were sinning all over the place, what did God do? He sent his only begotten Son. He decided a last sacrifice would be sent to cover humanity, to forgive you of every infraction. Father desires that all of us come to repentance. That is to say that all of us turn away from evil. God actually desires all of us to turn away from darkness. And Jesus is our opportunity to fulfill that. I agree with the Father, not Satan. Satan wants you condemned. Satan wants you judged right now. He's the one that wants you judged. I don't agree with him. I agree with the Lord. 
So you got all these people that say, oh, well, so-and-so, like, like, like Trump. I heard somebody today, Trump should go to jail. Right? Who says things like that? Lucifer does. Lucifer does not, for, he, he doesn't believe in forgiveness, does he? That thief that was on the cross simply believed in Jesus. He did not make amends for what he stole. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Why? Because to believe in Christ reveals the origin of your soul. I love that. See, when you're on this earth, you're prone to anything and everything. You're going to find yourselves in all types of darkness. I'm telling you right now, your father's concerned about the origin of you. Hmm? Do you hear me? All of us are sinners. How could God so easily look beyond everything we did wrong? Somebody answer that. Huh? Answer that. How could God send his son to forgive anybody and everybody of anything they ever did wrong? Why would he do that? Because he's not interested in your sin. The accuser of the brethren is interested in your sin. He is the one that accuses you. Your father is not accusing you. He's excusing you. See? That's why you don't walk around with a condemned heart. Just chew on that one for a while. Satan accuses and the father excuses. Do you hear me? So no, I don't agree with Satan. And I'm passionate about my stance against darkness, even within myself. You better believe that. Do you know what that means? Do you guys understand what that means? Do you, do you really know what that means? I want you to think about that for a minute. Your father in heaven is not interested in your sins. He's interested in you coming home. Do you hear me? That's his interest. That's what he has given effort towards. In you coming home. All the way home. And all this time it is Satan who's been accusing you, condemning you and everything else your father never did. If God ever condemned someone, they would not be alive. Your father wants you all the way home. He knows exactly who you are. See, we all too often, we don't know who we are. And the other person does not know who you are. Your father knows exactly who you are. Why do you think it seems like we've gotten away with everything? Because the Lord has no interest in condemning us. A day will come. A day will come. And all those who agreed with Satan finally are drenched. But that time is not now. People are deceived. People are lured into sin, trapped into situations. God knows when a person agrees fully with Satan or not. When a person agrees fully with Satan, their time will come and they will not escape. But right now, God is interested in your salvation. Not your condemnation. He wants you all the way home. He's not interested in your sin. He desires that all, all mankind comes to repentance. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I agree with the Lord. I do not agree with Satan and his condemning, accusing tongue. And I will never join in with his worldly mouthpiece. They love to condemn. They love to exercise authority over one another. I don't love what this world loves. I do love the ways of the Most High. I do. I really do. And in the Bible it says that Jesus came that he might destroy the works of the devil. And in the Bible it says Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I will not become what Satan is, an accuser of the brethren. Your brother is everybody but you. Do you know that? Just like your neighbor. Well, now you know the tactic and tactics and what's behind it, what his hope is and what the father's been doing. It's up to you to employ it, to put it into practice, into use. That's up to you. 
you, you'll never be forced to agree with righteousness or unrighteousness. It's totally up to you. The Lord desires your freedom, and he wants you all the way home. He's got a place for you, just for you. Folks, that's all I got for you tonight. That's it. That's all I got for you. That's all I got for you. Hope I didn't, you know, jam them bamble too much. Hope I didn't. I hope I didn't. Hope I didn't. Hope I didn't. Somebody said any updates about Planet X? Well, we'll have some updates. Not tonight. Not tonight. Dealing with the heavens, you're, you're okay tonight. You're okay tonight. I have a, no, I have a high confidence. Everybody's okay tonight. Deal, man, we have to deal with mankind and terrorism. When we do start to go over things of the heavens, I'm telling you right now, it's, it's, some things are frightening, especially when examples are going to follow the conversation. Because I'm going to speak about those things in a certain timing. It's time that everybody see what's changing. These are days where you can actually see. Folks, but that's all I have for you tonight. We'll get into a deeper conversation about things in the future, as, as for certain. Listen, you guys back up your systems. I'm going to do that right after this talk. I encourage every single last one of you to do the same. This is my warning to you to back up your systems, your computers and devices. Back them up. If you don't know how, ask someone. You guys help each other out. Terrorism is real. Cyber threats are real. There's a standing threat that's too real. If you don't want to lose everything, back it up. Back it up. Folks, we'll continue. This is this is one of our days. I'm so, by the way, I'm so excited about our bandwidth because I was doing some coding right before I got on, and it was flawless. It was flawless. It is, it is awesome. So listen, I'm encouraged, and we have a lot to do, yes. And everything was stagnant for quite some time. Right, We tried it once. It broke all the way down, right? But it did break down this time, so I'm encouraged. I'm going to wipe some things, and new things will go up, all right? Uh, so we can get our tool sets in there. But I'll tell you something. I am uh, I'm in that final, the final lap. I'm on the final lap with you guys. Hope you can keep up. Hope you do keep up, right? But there's, I, I keep, it, there's no slowing down. Listen to me. I can't slow down, right? There's a timing to this. There's a timing to it. I, there's no slowing down. And I'm not controlling the timing. I'm not. If a person could see a wave coming, right? And hardly anybody else had binoculars. That person would have to operate and do things by what that person saw not what everybody else thinks. This case is no different. It's no different. I have to operate fully in truth by the timing the Lord gives me, not by what everybody else thinks. You guys, you have to follow what the Lord has put in you. I will disclose exactly what I'm doing, my precise concerns, and a host of other things. But it's up to you guys to operate by the, listen, operate by the truth of what the Lord gives you. If the Lord confirms something in you, great. Do not act upon anything the Lord did not confirm in you. Don't do it. You're going to hear that quite a, quite a few times in these uh, next couple months. You will. But for tonight, back up your systems, please. Back them up back them up. Folks, God bless you. And the Lord will keep you. He will bring you home all the way. He will. He will. Somebody says, Brother Mike, what about the KD files? That is part of my disclosure to you. We can finally get those in route on the way. Right? We did try once. It broke the system. We tried a test, uh, test launch of it and we were seeing how the downloads of those PDFs would, you know, act to the service and they totally overwhelmed it. Stopped uh, services that should have been stopped. So there we had to, we just had to get, I'm, I'm kind of cheap, 
right? I'm, I'm doing everything at minimal cost. I mean, at the bare basics of what we can do things at. And, um, yeah, I, I don't want to spend a penny extra in anything. I don't. If there's a way to get around anything, I'll do it. I, I will. Right? So that's that's just the way we operate. We're, we save money. We try to save money on everything. We do. That's a smart way to operate. Smart way. Plus, need to be independent. Totally self-reliant. Right? And uh, we have to make sure we stay on that track. Things break down. We're going to be operational. We're blessed not to be able, not to have to depend on other folks' technology. We don't. So that that's a blessing. That really is a blessing. All right, folks. Remember that about the backing up of your systems and your pictures and everything else. All you have to do is imagine your device is wiped clean, right? If you can imagine your device wiped clean, then you'll find out what's important. Just imagine yourself losing everything because all the the entire industry is putting out is going to put out a warning. They're going to put out a warning. That means uh, Windows folks, don't be surprised if you see a message that says, back up your systems. And then you hear have another option that says, at your own risk, don't back up your systems. In a very serious time, everything. Remember that. Because if your providers of your cell phones are knocked out and their data is compromised and your stuff is sitting on a cloud, you've lost everything anyway. Somebody said, lost my hard drive last year. I lived, yep. So flashlight, you know, I, I've done that a few times. I have. There's a coordinated effort. It's quite expensive. I mean, it's very expensive. So please back up your, back up your things, please. Back up your things. All right. Whatever you decide to keep so that you can keep them. Some These days, it's not like the old days. Some people keep pictures on digital devices, and they really do believe they're going to have them forever. That's not true. It's just not true. Okay? Not true. I say, Brother Mike, what about share holders like MAGA, MAGA holders or mega holders? Well, it's up to them. You know, it's something they have to, each person, each person must consider their own path. They do. They must consider that with Christ. They must be free in their decisions. So it's their decision. Right? I, if, if Nobody can replicate what I'm doing. Not in everything, because the Lord made me a specific way, just like he made you a specific way. You are extremely unique. There's only one of you. And right? so every decision you make, you have to do that based in the truth. The Lord confirms internally within you. So this is Mike, can you recommend a backup drive to buy? I don't want to, but maybe I can come up with some recommendations tomorrow based upon some pretty good dependability, right? Because the Lord knows uh, I've gone through quite a few pieces of equipment that uh, sounded good, looked good, all the specs are right. Your ratings were awesome, and they were just didn't hold up. They didn't hold up, but there are certain devices that have gone through everything, right? And wow, they still they are still kicking. I don't want to trash any companies out there either, so I got to be careful with that. Okay, I got to be careful. Just just take note of something, guys. This 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 rule stays. You know these small memory cards and things that we have. That memory card is not permanent. It's prone to things. It is. I've been surprised quite a few times by memory cards that have been totally empty after having things on them, right? So one type of media to have that seems to keep, if you can, if you can kind of protect the temperature generally of it, honestly, is a CD or DVD. Now, just keep in mind, whatever reads, it's going to be a mechanical device, right? But it is one of the most, uh, it, is a, it is one of the best ways to store data. I would, I always keep backups, the same backup in multiple locations, at least three. I always do that. I have three backups of everything. And that's on CD just in case one location is burnt, frozen, or whatever the case is. I have another location with the same backup in it. 
I'm kind of paranoid about backups. Once we start, because if I lost everything that would set us back so far, it wouldn't even be funny. Of course, I'd do it again, right? It's, programming is fun for me, but still, you know, you, we don't want to go back to the Stone Ages like that, right? We don't want to do that. Somebody says, what radio do we need to keep in touch with COT? Well, it's something that um, near a specific time, I'm going to start giving out a small device. It's for your phones. And it bypasses all cellular networks and all that stuff. But that does not use that. It uses something totally different that every device has a capability of using that's not dependent upon satellites. We cannot depend upon satellites. I have a strong I, I'm, I have a strong inclination towards shying away from anything dealing with satellites. I know that's going to, uh, the atmosphere is going to be an area of great compromise. But there's one thing that will stay, right? There's one thing that will continue to function. And I'm utilizing that, that avenue. I'm going to utilize a specific avenue because it will remain functional. It'll be able to travel. And in fact, if it stops working, we can no longer live in the first place. So I'm good to go, right? But I won't depend on uh, what, what I'm not taking the direction most people take. And don't worry, I'll, we'll have, as we get closer, we'll point all those things out. All of them out. All of them out. And that's it. That's, that's it. Okay, guys, listen, I'm going to see you guys next time. If the player turns on at midnight, that means something else is urgent. And I'll probably be on for 15 minutes to give you guys an urgent update. In fact, don't find it strange if I come on multiple times throughout the day, okay, um, with advisements. You might have to get used to that from, from time to time. We do have active storms right now. Thank God they settled down a little bit in certain areas. But we know that when the heat returns, so will they, right? It's almost like God gave everybody a reprieve momentarily. People have gone through quite a few things. Even last night, it was bad weather. Listen, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Never take this weather lightly. Please never take it lightly. This is just the beginning. Okay? Just the beginning. So with that, I'm going to say God bless everybody. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at the Council of Time. And uh, hey, continue to pray for me that my stamina stays so I can get all of what needs to be done done. I have so much to share, so much, so much. Somebody says, what about AI during cyber attacks? I wouldn't worry about AI. We're, we're still going to have a presentation on AI. The nature of AI is what uh, I'm going to go over. I think that a lot of people just don't know the nature of AI. They're so clever uh, in media when they talk about AI, right? But anybody who has ever worked with a neural net I mean, on the programming end of it, right? Not just tier one, but all tiers. They have an understanding of AI that other people do not. They have a working knowledge of it. Now, some people try to protect how it works at an early stage. And some people I've found out, they're only familiar with archaic AI. They're not familiar with a new type of systems that have been evolved since the beginning of this year. They have no idea about them. So we're going to have to have a presentation to bring everybody up to speed. So you truly do understand what you're what you're what you're dealing with we're talking about fully autonomous fluid systems I've, I've told everybody before that there were soldiers in the field moving just like human beings nobody could tell if they were human beings or not now i was just not talking just to talk i was telling you something something very important back then and that ladies and gentlemen was back in 2016 think about it that was 2016 2016, a lot of people are acting like AI just came out 2023 and 24. That's a lie. That's one of the biggest lies. That's a lie. That's a big lie. They show these robots on TV that are jerky, right? With some servos that they bought from Kmart. Oh, Kmart doesn't exist, but you know what I mean. That's a, all that's a lie. They think that Boston Dynamics is is the leading robot manufacturer maker that's a lie it's a lie it's a big lie i'll say it again they have they have autonomous systems out there that move just like you and i there is no way you can tell them from yourself you, you just can't do it you they can't do it there have been some who have been field tested 
That period is done. The data is back. They've been long time that even the soldiers did not know. Anyway, I'll leave that be. People have, the next step is to experience it. They're going to experience that in the wrong way. But that was back in 2016. Also said at the onset of COT as is something very important. That when you guys see lasers utilized in the desert, that's World War III. And World War III coincides with a heavenly event. That's when it takes place. That's, that's what I have to give you. I can't comment on anything anybody else said. I can only comment on working knowledge I have. Yes, it's still worth learning the code. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I would love to have a team up to speed here in COT with AI neural nets. That would be awesome. All right, folks. I'll engage in some more talks. Later on, you guys are keeping me hostage. No, I appreciate it. I do enjoy it. I appreciate it. Right? I'm your employee. Let's put it that way. But I'll see you guys tomorrow. Right? If the player turns on at midnight, then I'll be here at midnight. God bless each of you. And as always, thank you guys. I'm always, I'm always, uh, this is always something to look forward to. It really is. So I do appreciate and I'm deeply honored with this. This is a privilege, a, a scary privilege, but a privilege. God bless each of you. Someone says, all right, so no, don't be sorry for questions. Never be sorry for questions. You can never be sorry for that. I like questions. God bless you guys. I'm going to see you guys next time. God bless. Oh, and we have the same song, so I'll only play two iterations and I'll turn everything off. So, God bless.